actually after resuscitation can be good, neutral, and it can be bad. And sometimes in really difficult situations, you know, leaders are born, people gain confidence in their own abilities, and you get real positives out of a negative. And, and post-traumatic growth kind of describes that phenomenon where people kind of come out the other side, actually better people and better for having been involved in something really horrible. Hello and welcome to the World Extreme Medicine podcast. I'm Dr. Fionn Davis, your host for today. I'm an emergency medicine doctor and expedition doctor. And in this session, we're speaking with Matt Walton, a fellow emergency medicine doctor working as an A&E registrar up in the north of England. Uh, delighted to have you on the podcast, Matt. Welcome. Thank you very much, Fionn. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and I'm very excited to talk about what we're going to talk about. Absolutely. So I first heard about Matt's involvement with the Resus Council Resuscitation and Wellbeing Guidance um, and Resource when we were working together on one of the WEM courses up in North Wales. Um, and we realised that we had a bit of a mutual interest in this and I kept an eye out for when this was getting published because he was eagerly working on it in every spare moment he had when we were on the course. And um, it, the guidance has recently been published earlier this year. So that's the Resus Council resource on resuscitation and well-being for responders i'm sure you're going to put it much better than i have matt but do you want to give us a little bit of an of an overview about this and then maybe a bit of what got you into it yeah of course um so this is the resus council well-being resource for responders and it's a resource that's the first of its kind that essentially tries to answer that question of what can we do in order to protect, preserve and, and help the well-being of responders who, let's face it, go to lots of nasty stuff every day and sometimes get affected by what they do. And it's an amazing thing to have been involved in and, and have got to work on because we've managed to get experts from all across the world who are really the, the top in their field to contribute to this resource. And hopefully it represents the first iteration and the best effort of information that we can give to people to kind of get some consensus on those topics that we've previously found a little bit muddy like debriefing for example and hopefully give us some direction and guidance as to what we can do in the aftermath of some of these difficult events. Yeah absolutely I think it's one of those topics that many of us have developed our own sort of way of dealing with things or our way of conducting debriefs or looking after well-being or promoting well-being in our teams but there's never really been um, a, a kind of evidence-based guidance out there so this is long awaited and much needed and hopefully is going to provide some overarching principles on how we should be doing those things in order to look after our people our teams and ourselves a little bit better um, so how did you first get involved with this Matt what, what how did your interest start so Interest started probably about five or six years ago when I was a medical student and I got an opportunity to basically follow a pre-hospital care team in an air ambulance and get to see some real cutting edge medicine, which was, I think, Fionn, you're also interested in this, probably the most exciting thing you can do as a student is to go and ride in a helicopter and watch some really cool people do some really cool stuff and ultimately save lives. Uh, so for me, it was like a dream come true. And I remember meeting a doctor called Mike Christian and a paramedic called Tony, who were both super inspirational. And I got to watch them really perform amazing miracles for people. But on the flip side to that, uh, I learned the hard way that the closer you are to saving lives, the closer you are to witnessing death and, and, and seeing some really nasty things. And I remember I got to see my first cardiac arrest. I got to see, you know, hangings and uh ultimately we had one case that was particularly difficult that was a traumatic cardiac arrest in a child and it was the first one that i'd ever seen like that and i remember in the aftermath of that i kind of experienced flashbacks and intrusive thoughts and and you know i'd be in a supermarket and little reminders would would trigger these really quite visceral reactions in me and I remember thinking that that could have been something that was really isolating and really frightening and really scary because ultimately at medical school and back then there was very little information and very little education on, on that sort of thing. But having had a chance to sort of debrief the case and think about what we could have learned and done better, 
I also had the opportunity to ask the doctor, you know, what, what do I do now? And what could happen to my brain, basically, after this event? And they delivered some really simple but profound education. And it was basically, you know, you got a sense that it was built on a lifetime of experience in, in this field. And it was, you know, yeah, we all get affected by this. Um, yeah, it, it can affect your brain. It can make you feel really sad at times. You can also get flashbacks and symptoms similar to, to what we get in PTSD. But it's, it's really common. And if you do get this, talk about it with us. It will, in all likelihood, get better over time. Um, and he also gave me the opportunity to talk. He said, well, you know, why don't you give me a text and I'll text you in a little bit, like in a few weeks' time, and we'll just see how we're doing and kind of catch up with each other. Um, and, and that just, as simple as it sounds, completely blew my mind because it was the first person that I'd ever really acknowledged that this was a thing. Um, and so... From there, we talked with the paramedic and we realized that actually the paramedic had had a really similar sort of experience and realized that, you know, these experiences are really common, but we're all kind of not talking about them as much as we could. Um, and so we kind of made our aim to educate as many people as possible and kind of share that simple education and also get to the bottom of the problem, understand about it and figure out how we could fix it. Um, and so we, set about making a film together essentially to capture our story and to sort of deliver some of those learning messages and at the time that was considered a really big risk because it was essentially taking an air ambulance team who is funded by public donations and saying well you know this team's just got really mentally hurt by what they've done and 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 the public have funded this and, and it, is there a chance that the public might decide not to continue donating like because this stuff wasn't really well known and in fact you know the public have a really good understanding of the military you know people go to war they get ptsd and they and 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 that's a sort of common phenomenon we we understand quite well but we don't really understand people going to work in as a paramedic on the roadside on christmas day and then coming back and not being able to enjoy Christmas dinner with their family and having a terrible night's sleep and being profoundly affected by what they've seen. And the, um, I'll have to get the name right, King's College Mil Military Health Research Group, they did a lot of research on military veterans, essentially estimating the prevalence of PTSD symptoms. And after the Iraq and Afghanistan involvement of the British Army, they estimated it around about 6%. And there's recent studies showing that in uh, acute care services, it's actually about 10% that are using the same kind of tests and studies. So actually what we needed to understand as a public is that uh, PTSD, the idea of a paramedic going to work and then coming home and being really traumatized by what they've seen is actually almost more frequent and more common than what we see with soldiers. Uh, so we embarked on this massive quest of trying to get this information out there. We managed to make a BBC documentary essentially um, revealing a statistic on the Office of National Statistics website, uh, which had sort of been overlooked, saying, yeah, the paramedic suicide rate is double that of the general population. And um, through that, we got loads of positive feedback, we got loads of interaction with loads of different specialists, and then we managed to meet this enormous group of experts from around the world who'd all spent their lives working on this topic and kind of be able to pick their brain to understand some of the the nuances, some of the topics in, involved in it. Um, so I don't, I'm aware that I don't want to talk your ear off, Fionn, um, <laughs> and, 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 and go on for, for, for too long on, on this topic. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of I'm wondering from your perspective, like how much you think this field's changed kind of over the last five or six years since then? Because all of this, what kind of got me interested was quite a long time ago. And since then, I guess things have changed a little bit. Yeah, I suppose I don't remember getting any formal training on um, how to how to react or what would be expected after a difficult resuscitation, especially in medical school. I don't really think that was touched on upon much. And I think my big revelation was um, when I was a sort of F2, F3, working in ED um, and kind of thinking that 
we were just supposed to absorb this, that this was just part of the job, that it was part of the process of toughening up and uh, just being able to cope with it and deal with it. And it's kind of that realisation that you had that actually uh, once you start talking to people about this, generally everybody is having the same sort of feelings about it but not really talking about it. Um, I suppose since then, since I sort of had that realisation that if I'm feeling like this, probably other members of the team are feeling like this also. (laughs) Um, I've tried to incorporate debriefs in some form or other like a hot debrief or cold debrief I think we're going to go into that a little bit more and I'm sort of thinking about how to best protect myself and how to look after a team as well um, as as I've sort of progressed a bit through my career but I've kind of been winging it (laughs) for the most part watching what other people do and then trying to figure out what works for me but I've not really had any formal training in it and I think this is probably the kind of first step towards um, incorporating that and I think that's reflected by the recess council courses as well starting to incorporate a little bit of um, sort of debrief and well-being within ALS um, and resuscitation as well yeah and and I, I, I guess yeah hit the nail on the head like the, we've all sort of been weighing it and we're desperate for expert advice and expert input um, and I think if to sort of name a few people who've been quite pivotal in the resource and sort of what they brought to our understanding, not not just for this resource, but sort of in mental health as a whole. Um, so one thing is, well, we we kind of made this assumption that it's you know it's PTSD, so it's like it's it's as I've simplified it there, like you know you've got someone who goes to see something nasty and, and gets PTSD, but. Is that the whole story? Is PTSD the only thing we need to worry about, first of all? So we've uh, got moral injury. So I'm not sure if that's something that you've heard of, Fia. That actually came onto my radar in COVID, um, which I think is probably the same for most people, that um, this concept of uh, not being able to provide what we feel we should be able to, um, and that is compromising to our to our moral values so in covid that you know that sort of manifested as um not being able to get everybody a ventilator who needed one um yeah that was a sign of kind of common thing that started happening we're like right well this person needs to go to itu there's no itu beds um right well what do we do now um and it probably led to little slips in our maybe judgment as, as to we probably had to get a little bit harder in terms of you had to be um, you had to be really, really fit <laughs> and really, really in, you know, in need of a ventilator in order to get one during COVID. And that but we know that that's not best practice or not what we would want to do. And so it's sort of highly damaging to how we see ourselves as a doctor. Are we no longer a good doctor? Are we, are we making bad decisions because we, we work in a broken system? Um, and how, yeah, that, that, that was kind of how moral injury first came across my radar anyway. And it's yeah, inherently linked to many, well, many right. like, I think healthcare, phys- healthcare in general, paramedics, doctors, whatever, like our identity is, is, is part of our profession. So we, if we somehow feel compromised in the, we're not we're not a good doctor or we're not a good paramedic because we can't deliver the care to our patients that we want to because we're stuck on the back of an ambulance for 20 hours for example um somehow that's compromised who we are which is i think even harder to deal with exactly um and no it's beautifully put and and that so esther murray essentially is the the uh uh psychologist and 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 doctor who's who's uh, pioneered this sort of uh, use of moral injury to describe how we're feeling sometimes in medicine and she looked at a lot of research in Vietnam war veterans who exactly as you're describing it's essentially like a shame of of, of what's happened and, and feeling like you know you're not good or or it's it's not so much like the the visual uh, aspect of, of trauma it's, it's more that like something isn't right here or I've done something wrong or I've been a part of or I've witnessed something that just isn't I don't agree with like this and I don't think this is right. And they were finding that a lot of the veterans who were suicidal, 
they, they weren't able to kind of put their finger on it with PTSD and there was something deeper and it was this kind of idea of taboo and stuff that we we don't really we're ashamed of even talking about um is is a big factor in how moral injury really affects us and I think we probably find that in our own practice you know sometimes we might even find it easier now that we've got a good awareness and a good openness to talk about traumatic things that we see um I think possibly one of the next things to, to sort of break the taboo on is things where we think we've messed up or we've made a mistake or or we, we've we've done things that aren't right or, or that we, we don't feel feel happy about in our soul um and so esther murray kind of really brought that into medicine and sort of uh she's released a book recently called borrowed borrowed words which essentially summarizes that idea of it's it's creating words that we can use to to, to describe how we're feeling in those situations which is really helpful um, so that was one thing as uh, alongside PTSD. And then you've got anxiety, you've got depression, you've got compassion fatigue, you've got burnout. There's lots of ways to describe the negative effects that this can have on us. Um, and uh, one person as, as, as well, um, uh, Dr. Kevin Teo, uh, uh, I've been really inspired by because they essentially said right we're we're trying to conceptualize responder well-being as this you know you see this it's like cause and effect and and you've got this thing happens and then you feel really bad afterwards but actually what if we take a step back in our understanding of responder well-being and we think well that's one thing but what about everything else that makes us feel upset or, or bad at work and he essentially said well what about the organization and the environment that we're working in and, and as soon as you say it, it makes total sense. It's like, well, what about the fact that we're working night shifts and we're not getting any any sleep, all of these system things? What about the resources that we have available? You know, we, we both work in NHS A&Es in 2023 in, in a sort of legitimate national crisis. Um, what, what about civility and, and people being nice to you at work and, and, and all those things? Like, what about your pay, your, your, your benefits, your resources, your sense of value, autonomy? All of these other things really come into it. Um, so, and, and as well as that, you know, working through crisis as well, you've got Professor Richard Williams, who's done loads of stuff on that with uh, someone called Verity Kemp. Um, and you've got Professor Neil Greenberg, who's been a huge part in our understanding of going back to that route of PTSD and what should we be doing with debriefing. And essentially what I'm trying to say is we've been lucky to have so many experts who completely shaped our understanding and really devoted their lives to trying to get the best understanding for us, the responders and the people on the ground, so we can kind of devise some sort of roadmap for what's the best way to help us. And I guess that's where this new resource comes into it. It's built on years of experience from everyone. And hopefully for the first time, it creates some consensus with the best organization to do that with which is the recess council who are sort of the 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 masters of creating expert world leading consensus on what's the best thing to do in this situation um and putting it together and there we have after quite a few years the resuscitation council well-being resource a short history to it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's important to understand the background but and how much work and how much expert advice and input has gone into this guidance, because um, when you do look through the resource, there is some really valuable things in there. And I think, should we go through some of the main sort of points of the of the resource and then talk through exactly um, how that can be applied in practice, I guess? So let's think about... Um, yeah, well, do, I'll let you, you, you wrote it, you can, uh, <laughs> rather than me question your in each individual section. <laughs> so, um, so essentially the, the structure of the resource, if, we, if I'll give a brief summary of it, and then we can kind of go in bit by bit, and then we can talk about, you know, I'm sure uh, as, as we've had a bit of pre-discussion and we've got a lot of uh, cases that we can bring in and I think this is going to be a full-on therapy session for me and Theon as we talk about <laughs> all of the uh, things that have happened to us in our practice. Um, so the structure or uh, uh, well, the premise is essentially you know as a resuscitation provider most of the cases that you go to by definition will be unsuccessful. The person will die despite your active efforts to save their life, as we know with the statistics of resuscitation out of hospital cardiac arrest, in hospital cardiac arrest, it's more likely that they are going to be dead at the end of the day than alive. Um, and that's the reality. And it's it's essentially, it's a duty of ours to provide help 
and guidance and information for people to try and alleviate the potential suffering of that process on, on responders. So the structure is, how will your well-being be affected by being involved in resuscitation, as we've termed it, an exposure to resuscitation? Um, what is the recommended post-resuscitation procedure? What should we all be doing after exposure to resuscitation? What, where's the evidence and, and what currently do we have evidence for doing? Um, and then the third bit is having that perspective and taking that step backwards to say, well, resuscitation exposure and the immediate effects are one thing, but responder well-being isn't just a binary, are you going to resuscitation or not? And are you affected by resuscitation or not? It's actually this really nuanced, multifaceted thing of you're working in an environment and actually your environment has arguably more of an effect on your well-being than whether you're exposed to a resuscitation that is traumatic for you or not. Um, and then we split that into organisational factors, leadership, leadership factors, sort of in, inter-colleague and, and interpersonal factors, and then individual tips on what we can all do for ourselves. And basically how you can help at every single level uh, in your organisation and all the way down to just personally you as to how you can try and preserve and protect your well-being while you're doing what's uh, often a very gnarly and very stressful job. So... Uh, well, let, let me ask you, Fionn, you've you have told me that certainly you've been involved in a lot of cases and you're ex incredibly experienced at this point. Um, how do you find your well-being is affected by exposure to resuscitation? You can see I, I'm, I'm smiling wryly uh, because, I, <laughs> because I still feel that I'm very, very inexperienced and there's definitely a lot of, um, you know, High, highly highly experienced people out there who may have worked with me who may be thinking ha Fionn that little baby genie doctor we used to work with um but anyway I, I have uh I guess been fortunate or unfortunate enough to have had some seminal cases that uh that certainly stick out in my mind um as being difficult so I think when I first started working in A&E as a clinical fellow in F3 um so there was one resuscitation, I guess, um, which was of a, a, a teenager overnight who had come off a motorbike. He'd been shunted from behind um, on a motorway, fairly high speed, and had um, sustained some very nasty max fax injuries, um, massive head injury, and was essentially scooped up by the paramedics. It was an off-duty paramedic who actually found this poor lad. Um, already had I think uh I think it's seen they said the resps were sort of seven gurgly and they put in an OP and they'd kind of just they were five minutes from the hospital because it was literally just one exit down the motorway so they just brought them as quick as they could and it was one of those kind of moments where you know you, you take a hand over and you say are there any immediate concerns um and the paramedics were like airway <laughs> I was like oh right <laughs> Okay, so right, this is it, guys. Like, this is the real deal. Um, and my my registrar at the time was uh, also working with Wales Air Ambulance and was a very very good um, doctor that I admired a lot. And actually, I was so pleased that it was him that was on nights with me that time. And he did an excellent job of leading the resuscitation team. Um, I mentioned that we, we didn't, he had a lot of max fax injuries. We didn't actually know how old he was um, until we sort of found out a bit later. He was actually 17. Um, he was on his way home from uh, work. And um, this, he had very unstable facial fractures. He had bleeding into his airway. It was very difficult to intubate. He then had a, he had a pneumothorax. He had swallowed a tooth. Uh, he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. He had lots of multi-organ injuries um ended up being transferred to the major trauma center uh, where you know he he unfortunately died so my main learnings from this was um a that feeling of like right th this is it this is what we train for this is the moment that all that training is going to come in, into into practice um and how the team actually felt afterwards was fairly positive in that we felt we'd done a good job. We felt we'd resuscitated him well. We'd had really good leadership from the registrar um, and we felt we'd done all we could 
And there was a clear sort of debrief afterwards on um, this is what happened, ABC, we did this, this is why. Um, this was hard. Some people are going to feel affected by this. Um, and then I think he said something like, you know, like come and talk to me if you, if you need to sort of thing. Um, so for me, that was right. I want to be this guy. This guy, he has made all the difference to how this team feels about this resuscitation, the way he's ran it, the way, you know, so that, that was my main takeaway and probably a bit of a major inspiration for me was I was completely flapping, very junior, didn't know what to do. Um, and yeah, felt felt very helpless and lost at that point. And I'm so glad that he was there to help sort of guide me through it. And now I want to be that person, if I can, um, that, that A, smashes the trauma recess and B, um, really helps guide my juniors as well through it yeah definitely and well thanks so so much for sharing that because uh, that definitely doesn't sound like an easy case to be involved in. in fact it sounds like probably one of the worst cases imaginable to be faced with um but it it, it sounds amazing that you've got that uh, positive uh outcome from it and and obviously the outcome for the patient was terrible and and i'm sure it, you know it will have been devastating for everyone involved in it. Um, however, despite that, you've kind of taken away from that, that you want to improve and, and you want to learn and be better. And I'm sure, you know, you're going to save loads of lives moving forwards from the inspiration and, and the drive that you've got, if not many lives already. Feel. Um, and um, and that's, so that's I suppose, something called post-traumatic growth. So, and it's an important thing to mention that, uh, you know, the assumption is that you'll go to resuscitations and something you'll feel ter terrible afterwards and it'll affect you profoundly in a negative way for the rest of your life. But actually, after, resuscitation can be good, neutral, and it can be bad. And sometimes in really difficult situations, you know, leaders are born, people gain confidence in their own abilities, and you get real positives out of a negative. And, and post-traumatic growth kind of describes that phenomenon where people kind of come out the other side actually better people and better for having been involved in something really horrible um so i guess the nutshell and, and the learning from that which is really helpful in that case is that it's not all bad um but, but a lot of the time sometimes it is very bad and, and 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 sometimes it does it does really really affect us doesn't it yeah i think as well that i'm just remembering um, I don't think I really had any good expectation on on how I was going to feel afterwards, but I don't I don't remember being told oh that that, that this is going to be upsetting um, that you might have some sort of flashbacks or intrusive thoughts sort of things about this, um, and that's normal. Um, I don't I don't sort of remember being told that, but I did have that where I had these sort of moments where. I'd see his face um, or where I could remember sort of trying to jaw thrust him and everything moved under my fingers. Um, I just couldn't and just all horribly unstable. And I'd get those thoughts just sort of just popping into my brain, um, whether it was doing something else at work to do with a, a face. Um, you know, if I was like examining somebody's jaw or something and then that would sort of that image would come into my head or yeah thinking about how it how it felt and that would that would sort of come back to me for several months afterwards um so I wasn't really sure if that was normal or not at the time um and I remember speaking to some of the other people involved and it was one of those cases that gets talked about in the department for quite a while afterwards because everybody was sort of like oh my god did you hear about that um yeah. and other people we're finding that too. Yeah. So, uh, well, what you're describing certainly is absolutely common, and it's and it's and that I, I'm relating completely to that in the case that I described at the start, and it's it's um, I still find it uh, amazing in some ways how common all these experiences are, and how you know often people experience this. But as you say. You, you don't know whether that's normal or not because because historically it's not really been talked about and we're not 100 percent sure what is normal and what's not um so i guess that goes on to the to, to the to the next 
part of the resource quite nicely is yeah w- what is normal to feel afterwards um so it, it, in effect a lot of the the numbers and the cutoffs we put on things are going to be arbitrary that there's you know we we say roughly you know if symptoms persist after about a month then it's worth seeking support and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's abnormal or not normal it's just a point at which it would be worth letting someone else know that you're still experiencing these symptoms because after after that point i suppose it you could fairly say it's had a significant effect on you if, if you if you're experiencing them that like that much and, and persistently um for me i experienced that and and again the the child that uh, particularly disturbed me had also had horrific facial injuries um and and it's and i think there's something especially about the face that just comes back to to haunt you um in a way like no other bodily injury will um so so you know it's it's normal to think about these things afterwards definitely um and i guess the question is you know wh- when do we start to to flag up that as a concern and i think at any point after a month, we'd recommend that you talk to someone about that. Well, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, your official supervisor or your GP, just to, just talking to friends and family members and other colleagues, just so they're kind of aware of what you're going through. And ideally, the gold standard would be letting someone, ideally someone designated at your hospital, kind of know that, you know, that that's still something that's ongoing. So they can embark on this process called active monitoring, which is essentially where we're just like, yep, yeah, we're aware that's happening. And we're going to decide what to do either, whether that's escalating it, if you're really, really struggling and it's an interfering with your day-to-day life and we think we need to do something more or actually saying, you know what, like, yeah, you're experiencing these, if you're okay with it and you're still managing and, and you're kind of happy not to not to be intervened in at the moment, then we're happy with that too and we'll kind of just monitor you and just keep an eye on you and just check that these symptoms slowly start to resolve and, and, and get back to normal over time. Um, so that's essentially kind of where we're at with what's um, normal, what's not normal. It's a bit of a question mark. Everyone's going to have very different reactions. Um, you, we can turn them as the initial reaction as an acute stress reaction where you have a, a, a constellation of behavioural, psychological, somatic symptoms like lack of sleep, nausea, the actual flashbacks and, and visceral reactions to it. And that that's kind of commonly can last for like a, a, in that first month. And then any persistence after that is kind of, we'd like to capture that in a safety net to make sure that people aren't um, struggling. But the bottom line is, if at any point after the event you have severe sy- symptoms that are really getting in the way of your daily life and and you're finding it really difficult and you're getting in the way of your work or just simply that you're worried or, or you're not sure what's going on then just seek help ask someone talk to someone um it's there's no there's no point putting a time limit on it if it's affecting you it's affecting you now and and there's and there's ways that that help can be sought um yeah and, I've, but, I've heard uh, stories and, about people uh, sort of years after an event don't realize it but then years after you know sort of um developing yeah. more serious signs of, of ptsd and then um, not necessarily even relating it to the initial kind of stressor to start with but um but yeah it, it, there is there is no definite timeline is there but but the recommendation is like you said like a, a month or so um and then worth trying to seek some help just to make sure just to check in really isn't it it's not necessarily to say I think a big a big reason people don't seek help is that it's somehow admitting failure or admitting that you can't cope or the um which is the some I'm sure you're gonna go on to some of the stigma about it. Um but that's not true. It's it's about just saying look like that that was pretty rough. That was quite hard. I'm still struggling with it. Um think I'm okay or and I'm getting through it, or don't really think I'm okay, think I might need a bit of help with this. Yeah, exactly. Like I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> I think yeah, um, and um, and and it's also like with the stigma. I think because it, it, it's often hard. Like we feel a bit. I, even even me, who's literally helped to write this resource on well-being, you feel sometimes a bit powerless to help and a bit powerless as to what to actually say to, to someone. So when you're speaking, there's an element of, of I'm thinking in my head. Well, I, I don't. I don't really. I don't really know what I can possibly say that's going to make you feel better. Um, But actually sometimes listening is helpful. And also you 
saying about how you feel is massively helpful for me because and I've, and I've seen you talk about some of the cases you've been involved in before and that gives me reassurance that oh like Fionn's this like really epic doctor who does all this really cool stuff and actually like <laughs> she's kind of dealing with that as well and and that makes me think oh well it, like if I aspire to kind of do what you do in a, in a couple of years time then that's okay if I still feel like that like I, I, I shouldn't have this expectation like you described where it's kind of oh well your whole point of your medical career is to just toughen yourself up so you're never affected by these things which ultimately just isn't, isn't yeah. true at all because I think we're all affected all the time I think I think it's it's a bit of a journey too because as a junior you feel that you can't show weakness because you'll be seen to fail training or you're you're not good enough or you're not cut out to be a doctor and then as you get like slightly more senior you feel you can't talk about it or show weakness because your juniors are looking to you to be the strong one um or to be the to be the one that's okay with it all and that's gonna you know magically make everyone feel better and then I'm sure even as a consultant you know I'm not there yet but um I'm sure you still have those feelings of um not not feeling able to sort of show that vulnerability but on the flip side of that I think even from junior juniors all the way up to seniors in in terms of like doctor structure anyway, but also in, in pre-hospital and other healthcare professions. Um, if your junior says they're struggling, it then suddenly opens up the floor to everybody else to be able to say, oh yeah, like actually that was quite hard. Um, and if you've got a good, a good senior to support you, they should, they should be understanding. They should want to, yeah, want to understand how you're feeling rather than being like, oh, well, that's uh that's that's tough for you <laughs> um let's just crack on with the rest of the shifts um no and it might you might even find that by by saying something yourself you allow that that's possibly more senior person to say yeah that was a hard one and if you hear that from them it kind of just validates how how, how you feel as well um and I, and I think that probably brings us on to debriefing it and uh you know what we should and shouldn't be doing on, on that topic because i suppose that's that when you know especially as we're sort of branching into leadership positions now in our work and people look to you after those events to say something or know what to do uh and, and so far <laughs> as you put it nicely earlier we've kind of been winging it so um so uh es- essentially um what's rec- what we'd recommend now is and what we've tried to term and and, and structure based on the evidence we have available to us at this point in time is a post resuscitation procedure basically what you do after exposure to resuscitation and that consists of an operational debrief arranging active monitoring and periodic team reflection and these are the things that currently we've got some some evidence for being worthwhile to do um and that's as well as those things, it's plus or minus referring, as, as, which basically means, as we kind of touched on before, if we're worried that someone's badly affected and they might need some more help, then just signposting and making sure that they get to the resources that they need, whether that's the GP or in-house occupational health service, talking to the mentor and, and being monitored. Uh, so the debrief. Now, it's important to understand a bit of the history about why how we've debriefed in the past in order to understand where we're at now so coming at it from a well-being perspective there was a a a concept uh, which was sort of 10 years or so ago called critical incident stress debriefing which is basically after after an event we should get everyone down and we should go in detail about the traumatic nature of the event and you know talk about what was difficult about it and and how we can you know in, uh, protect our minds going forwards and they actually found that there was a chance or there was some evidence started to emerge that actually this could be harmful for people so talking in in, in massive detail purely with a focus on the trauma of the event and the difficulty of the event and the, and the horror of the event isn't necessarily that helpful for people it can solidify memories that later come back in, in a worse way on the flip side to that debriefing in order to learn and for performance is definitely indicated so across multiple uh, professions whether that's military or aviation meta-analysis shows that if you debrief your chance of doing better next time improves about 20 percent or so 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 
debriefing to learn and debriefing to say what what did we do what went well what didn't what can we do better next time definite yes so the big question is well if we're debriefing to learn then how do we address this elephant in the room of you know this was really difficult for everyone and and are we going to harm people if we do and the answer is no you're not going to cause harm by debriefing people with the primary focus being on learning but also having a consideration for people's well-being and and if, if nothing else it's just good leadership to do that um so i wondered if you've had any debriefs that you've been in, involved in feeling that you'd be able to describe and we can kind of see how some of the the recommendations that we've got here sort of play into them yeah so i'm thinking about um some of the cases that I've been involved with where it, um, we had we had bad outcomes. And it, so this was a while back and thinking of a particular case, a uh, young gentleman who'd taken paracetamol overdose who um, had had a staggered overdose. Uh, we didn't quite know how many or by when. He was very vague and then uh, presented with epigastric pain, horrible acidosis, horrible LFTs. And um, later, and, and platelets were sort of like 10 or something like that. Um, later arrested, um, but not before he'd uh, vomited up a load of blood and climbed off his recess trolley and was on the floor. <laughs> so it was traumatic all round because of the nature of the resuscitation. We were all kneeling in a pool of blood on the floor in recess, resuscitating a young man. Um, and... There was no formal debrief after uh, after the event. It was all sort of like, oh, right, okay, like let's just go back to shift then and just carry on, <laughs> um, which was – now you look back on it, you're like, this is completely ridiculous to expect that we could just wash the blood off and crack on uh, back to Mrs. Mrs. Doris in the waiting room. <laughs> um, but – that was that was what happened. Pretty much the whole team kind of dissipated, and we we're like, "Oh, right, okay, you know, um, unfortunate outcome. Uh, let's get the family in, and then we'll, uh, yeah, then we'll just carry on with our shift." Which um, left a lot of unanswered questions uh, about how the resuscitation had been handled. Um, had we done everything we could of? Is there anything we could have done differently to that, that might have changed the outcome? You know, probably not. Uh, but but those questions were sort of whirling around in my head. And then we had, um, this was a coroner's referral, and this was a serious incident review within the hospital as well. Um, and that meant that we had, I had to write a statement, I had to go through the events in quite a lot of detail, um, and I had to go through the whole psychological kind of how I felt at every point of that resuscitation and afterwards, um, which was, was definitely not helpful. Um, Instead of feeling that I could kind of park it and move on, um, it meant that I had to keep reliving it and going through it. Um, I mean, that's probably a whole separate topic on like how our, how our processes of review and, and coroners, et cetera, are potentially uh, yeah. not good for for providers or for healthcare physicians. But but it does emphasise the point that potentially dissecting cases in detail and going through the trauma it sounds it sounds kind of I don't know cliche to say so of the trauma of it but it is fairly traumatic and it's to say right to 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 debrief it in such a way that says okay so tell me how that made you feel um did you how why were you upset by that what what was upsetting and why was that difficult and it's like okay well let's dig into these really deep difficult topics um, again and again and again, uh, which wasn't helpful. <laughs> um, yes, so I, th I think certainly it's a, 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 a topic for another time to think about our processes because I, I agree, certainly it, it, I've luckily never been in that position yet, but I'm sure I will be where you're constantly having to go through something that actually you just don't want to don't want to be faced with. So um it's difficult the divide when you know you have a legal requirements to go through something again. But I think the first thing to say about debriefing is it, um, it it's it's kind of an opt out. So the premise being that the the focus is is how can we save someone's life better next time? And for that reason, as clinicians, we should all want to do a debrief for that reason. But we 
we also don't want to force people to be there who are actually like, you know what, the last thing I want to do right now is talk about this case. So the first thing to say is that people can opt out of a debrief. Um, if they don't want to be there, that's fine. But they should always be checked upon later if, if, they, if they don't want to be in it. And, and then debriefing generally follows a model of gather, analyze, summarize. Most of the literature is sort of like that sort of premise. And for the Research Council resource, we've used uh, the stop five model, which which uh, was developed in NHS Lothian by Craig Walker. And it's it's reasonably prolifically used. And it's very simple more than anything. It's it's easy to do. Um, and and I did one uh, for uh, one of the arrests that I'd led on the weekend on my night shift. And it's basically get everyone together for five minutes. Um, you, you grab the team you all get face to face with each other, introduce each other, and you say, right, we're going to stop for five minutes. We're going to do uh, things that went well, opportunities to improve, and then we're going to plan for the next actions that we need to do. Um, and it's as simple as that. We sort of talked about, like, you know, what did we do well? What can we enforce in our practice and, and keep doing? What things can we do? Uh, have we done badly? And it sounds like in that case, that would have been really helpful for you to have had the opportunity if someone else was leading that to then say, oh, well, actually, I, I thought we, we could have got them on a table or something and, and we could have maybe done that. And that would have like in future, maybe we, we would do that and everyone can say, yeah, actually, that's really good. Um, and then possibly to the point when we go, oh, well, we, we've, you know, we've used this bit of kit or we've made uh, this mistake here that actually other people could learn about. And we think we should email and, and circulate this learning round to the rest of the department. So that's essentially what, what a debrief is. And the the recording of it is something that, again, it's a new bridge to cross. We have to sort of have an opinion on how it should be recorded. And we've suggested that um, the whole point of a debrief is that people can speak very openly and learn. So that's the priority is to not create a barrier to that. And we thought if there's undue and, and over-documentation of that, if, if you're saying, I felt like I could have done this a lot better, and someone's sitting there writing that down going, all right, well, this will be good in coroner's court when we uh, absolutely nail you for admitting to that thing that you did wrong, that's not going to encourage people uh, to do a good, a good debrief. So it's really, it's recording who was there, recording a, a bare minimum of, of information about the content of the debrief, with the exception of um, any sort of critical issues that need to be reported for safety reasons, things that we would do an error report for, those types of things obviously still need to be reported in, in the usual way. And that's kind of the current best suggestion that we can come up with as to what should be recorded in a debrief. And then it kind of comes on to the, well, the elephant in the room is, is the psychological side of it. And, and how can we use this as an opportunity to best support the people that we have? And it sounds like in, in your case, you, you, you've kind of alluded to that sort of being a bit lacking and, and that idea of like sometimes, you know, it's, it's a show of good leadership to to acknowledge how difficult the event was. And, 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 and then, well, there's some things that we recommend can help for, for people. So one of them is educating people on those reactions. So as you said, sometimes people have no idea what their what their mind is about to do to them and, and they have no education. You know, if you've got someone on, on, in a pre-hospital setting, it can be so helpful to deliver that basic education that, that we all now kind of are a bit more familiar with on that process and what's common and what's not and, and when to seek help and to signpost to, to useful guidance. We can also kind of reassure on performance limits. So basically saying, the survival of this person did not depend on what you did then, if that's appropriate to say. Um, and sometimes it might not be. It's sometimes legitimately, and, and it's the thing that we all fear, is that we're in a situation where we have done an act or an omission that has actually killed someone. And um, and if that's the case, then, you know, it's a, you can only be a human in that situation and, and say what you think is the right thing to say at the time. But still striving to learn from that because we've kind of put a quote from Henry Henry Ford um, who made the Ford cars. He said that, you know, the, the only mistake is the one that we didn't learn from and that being the premise that no matter how bad it is, as long as we can learn and we can change from from this, this uh, event and, you know, either change yourself, change the system, uh, change whatever you can to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen again. Um, and then 
active monitoring and, and, and buddying up. And I think you, you'd mentioned a really good example of in your mountain rescue team, how they're really hot on making sure that we, they can buddy people and make sure that they can follow each other up and, and, and act, start that process of active monitoring, what we call it. Yeah, I think there's there's two good examples. I think I'm aware I've talked a lot about the bad examples, but um, I've experienced some good examples too. Um, so the the Hems team that I worked for up in North Wales had a system where if there'd been it would be flagged up, you know, example paediatric arrest or a hanging or something that sounded difficult. Um, the top cover consultant would call the team that was involved a couple of days later maybe the day after and just say uh yeah I, I saw that that case you had looked really difficult you know how are you guys doing you okay any any issues to flag up sort of thing so very kind of informal but um a nice way to just check in on people and i, I think as well that hems teams to some extent have got a, a big advantage in that they're close-knit teams small teams and they often have time to chat time to talk so there's often time on the way back from a job. There's time when you're back at base over a cup of tea and a biscuit. So they will informally debrief quite a lot, pretty much every, pretty much every case will be talked about, um, which is good. But then you've also got that more formal, like top cover consultant calling to check in. Then you've got the mountain rescue format, which is, um, I think, far more important in a way because uh, a lot of volunteers who are not necessarily medically trained, who see some pretty horrible stuff, um, and it may be the only time they ever see this horrible stuff um, because that it's not their day in day out job. Um, so I think it's even more important to, to check in on on mountain rescuers who are exposed to some pretty traumatic things. Um, so my team's got a system where our our leadership team has gone on the med trim course, the um, sort of trauma resilience training, uh, and they will get the team together immediately after incident as in still on scene immediately afterwards okay guys we're not going to talk about it now but this was a difficult case um we're going to be checking in with you in the next couple of days so they'll make a note of who was there um they'll make a note of anybody who appears particularly sort of affected um or sort of upset by this um and then get sort of assigned out to people who feel comfortable to talk to people about it um so often that is the paramedics or doctors in the team. Um, and then we sort of call up people and ask how they're doing after a particularly difficult case. Um, and it's not in a way that's like so um, chest compressions. That can be really hard because you can feel the ribs break and you can see the person's face getting you know, start bleeding out their airway and stuff. And like, that must be really difficult. Tell me about that. <laughs> it's not in a way that's trying to provoke trauma. Um, it's in a way to just flag up how are you feeling? Um, do you want to discuss anything? Uh, if not, that's absolutely fine. It's just a kind of like friendly check-in sort of thing. Um, I just wanted to mention here as well, I think it, it's um, there's the whole, you know, it's okay not to be okay thing, which is, I think, a good thing that's come out of COVID. But also don't feel any expectation that you should feel upset by things because sometimes you won't be upset by things and you may feel guilty and that, you might think you're a complete psychopath for not being upset by something. That's not true. <laughs> that's it. That's fine. You know, there is no right way to react to things. Um, and some people will be, you know, maybe completely traumatized by something that you're completely okay with. Um, and that doesn't make your reaction, you know, any less sort of normal. Um, there is no normal for these things. That's a, that's a fantastic thing to say. And, and we also, we have no way to predict currently who will react in what way or who will not and why and there's also no way to uh pre-screen people because they did that a lot in the military as well being basically like oh can we weed out the weak ones who are all going to cry after these traumas and stuff obviously that's not a weak thing to do at all like i think I i'll say i actually cried when i came back from my night shift it was so terrible um and and um i don't think that makes me a weak a weak doctor particularly and, and I know oh, I, i've people, cried you know, many obviously. times on shift it's 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 common as hell but basically we can't you can't predict who's gonna react when and how and, and why and um yeah the psychopath thing is is definitely a thing i am um, after having had this horrific experience in a pediatric arrest pre-hospital about uh seven months ago i got another opportunity to shadow an, an awesome uh 
uh, critical care paramedic on, on a solo car we had another pediatric uh, cardiac arrest and as horrific and sad as it was I felt a great sense of reward and, 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 you know, a sense of satisfaction from being able to do some more interventions and feel like a useful member of the team. Whereas previously I've been a rabbit in the headlights in those situations. And I felt overall positive after ultimately a child had died, which is a really weird thing to say. Um, and, and obviously it, it was horrendously sad and it made me very sad to think about it. But I actually felt a sense of satisfaction. I, I you know, felt a sense that that I'd, I'd done well in that situation and sort of got something out of it. Where I was like, yeah, like, like this is why I turned up to work. Like I've, I've tried my best here, and it's and it's gone well. Um, I so think. Can I just add on um, to that? That I think, I think many of our, um, I, I think naturally we feel inclined to look at outcome based uh, measures of performance, i.e., did they survive or not. Um, however, I think when you're talking about resuscitation, and you said this right at the beginning, you know, the majority, vast majority of our patients are not going to survive resuscitation. Um, and that's almost regardless of what we do. You know, we, I think we need to move away from out measuring our performance based on the outcome of the patient. Um, and we should move towards measuring our performance based on our performance. Um, and yeah. I think that how well is so much more healthier in terms of mindset. Yeah, and how, how well we actually think it went um, ver- versus yeah. did the patient survive or not. Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. Because a lot of the time, whether someone survives or not might be out of your control as a team, whereas what is in your control is to to drill yourself so that your your procedures are, are as good as they can be for that one person where it will literally make the difference, that, that absolute fine line between life and death. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um and um so, so we talked so a little bit about kind of, the um yeah yeah i was just, we, we talked about so the, i've given you a couple of examples of like the active monitoring that i've experienced subsequently um from like the hems team and the, and the mountain rescue team um so so what's the kind of next step after that then so hopefully if there's any negative symptoms that all kind of fiddle, fizzle out and disappear um referral as we say if, if there's anything ongoing and then after that, I suppose sort of what we're doing is like periodic team reflection. So like there's a thing called Schwartz rounds where people can kind of speak about cases which which have impacted them. And essentially that's helpful because it can act towards, again, helping us know how common these things are and, and, and also share kind of advice and, and tips with each other as to how we've managed to get our head around difficult things. Um, and it's just exactly what you've just done there saying, you know, actually, you know, if it, it is upsetting when when the outcome is bad for the patient but actually like sometimes we can take positives away from the process we've, we've, we've got there and, and and all of that sort of stuff where we can share our own real practical experience which i guess is, is the gold dust of of how how we can actually sort of get through all of these really difficult difficult experiences that we're putting ourselves through um and then uh the next section i suppose if we wanted to if we wanted to move on from there is trying to uh give perspective on on the debrief so so i suppose bluntly put it's probably a drop in the ocean when it comes to the well-being of a responder um and in that sense i suppose don't get too too um upset or, or don't feel too much pressure to to be able to fix anything in a debrief because because that's not really the purpose of a debrief and it's probably unlikely to to help all you can really do is capture people in a safety net and 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 just do the human thing to try and offer some supportive words um and actually there's all of these other things that have a huge impact so the the organization i think without going into it too much there's there's primary stresses which are the things that we ideally want to target so that's like your shift patterns your exposure to resuscitation um like your level of autonomy support in the workplace all of that sort of stuff the thing the things that kind of stress us out on a day-to-day basis like you know have, have you got tea making facilities all of these things are your kind of primary stresses and that's in the context of your psychosocial home environment all of that stuff all combined and that they're the things to, to for the organization, the, the caring and, and good leading organization to target and say, actually, can, can we make your life easier at work by helping get rid of some of this stress that the systems are putting on you? And then if that 
it's been maxed out and you've done everything you can do. So, for example, in the context of resuscitation, there's only a limit to how much you can avoid being exposed to that stressor. Night shifts, there's only a limit to, to how much you can stop people doing night shifts when you want a 24-hour service. Then you move on to, to your uh, secondary things, which is the stressor is there. How do we cope with and improve our ability to cope with that stressor? So that's your kind of resilience training. Um, your trim training, your debriefing, all that sort of stuff, which um, it allows people the opportunity to, to appraise how how they are responding to stress and if they can do anything differently. And then, of course, you've got your tertiary support, which is you know if if people are really needing help and they they need a, a professional who who is experienced at, at helping people through difficulties with their mental health that's the point when when they go in and of course every organization is going to need to have that sort of contingency and have have that because there will be a lot of us who need that support at one point or another in our in our lives so that needs to to be there too um and then thinking about what we can do as as le- leaders um the number one thing is, even though it sounds a bit trite, is just being a good leader. So the, the, the most reassuring thing for followers to protect their mental health is that their leader is doing a good job at, at, at what they're meant to be doing. So th- there's no there's no use in kind of being terrible and dangerous and haphazard at your day job, but, but being brilliant at bringing everyone cups of tea and donuts and stuff to, to, to help their mental health. Everyone's going to get quite stressed out at the, at the fact that like you, you're not focusing a hundred percent on your main job. So actually that's, that's the best thing to, to put energy into. If in doubt, just, just do your main job and do your primary role as a leader really well. And that's probably the best thing you can do. Um, and then colleagues look, talk, Talk to each other about it. Check up on each other. Be it be a person to to, to listen uh, to, to to you know when when you you finding your colleagues in difficulty and um, you mentioned about teams and the importance of kind of getting to know each other sort of on and off the pitch. So so I think you were saying before about the you, you know it's the advantage of having a really close knit team is just the tone of voice in which someone says hello to you in the morning. You'll be like oh what's wrong <laughs> whereas if you don't know each other then you've got no idea if someone's really struggling and they might be passed off as just being a bit grumpy or a bit rude and actually that, that you know it's by by really getting to know each other properly that's often the best thing and we often feel it the most when we're in new environments new job don't know anyone you've not got that real ally and that friendship and camaraderie there to, to, which is really really important to, to build and develop um and then individual things long- so this is <laughs> Oh yeah, go go for it. Yeah, uh, I was just going to add along the colleagues and sort of team type thing. Um, especially, I noticed this in A and E, and I think this is probably true of other places, <laughs> workplaces as well. But um, when you start your shift, you walk in, hey, hello, how are you? Are you okay? Um, and we don't really listen to the response. Yeah. <laughs> you ever noticed that? It's like a. It's yeah, like exactly. a. There's no. Copy yeah break, exactly know, uh, and we don't really ever get the opportunity to sit down and say how are you are you fine but I've started to make a bit more of an effort with this and I think um I've noticed other people doing it more as well is that um when you say like how are you wait for a response um and obviously listen and reflect and most people will say sort of oh yeah I'm good I'm fine whatever um but um some people's some and I and I do this as well something you know I'm I'm okay I'm just okay you know it's okay to not be just that automatic response of I'm good yeah fine yeah just you know busy etc and or you can just say "Mm, you know yeah I'm not really feeling it today but I'm all right you know it's it's fine to just not have that automatic I'm good response and it tells your colleagues so much more about you um than just your stock response yeah that's a good that's a good shout so actually saying maybe we should be a bit more in in our own (laughs) as well as being good at asking that question and waiting for other people and actually listening to what they've got to say actually in your own response not just being like yep all good (laughs) totally fine (laughs) despite all the horrific things that and the last like shift and, and all that sort of stuff yeah um, yeah yeah, uh, yeah exactly. and i find that we, we yeah you get a sense that we're kind of losing that i guess what used to be in the old like firm structures in hospitals and that like canteen culture and, and especially when you 
got shift workers, it's it's so difficult to have that continuity and and so it's it's things like designing rotors so that you can like fix teams together who pass through a rotor system so that they actually all can leave and you know, all plan to get breakfast together at the same time and creating like training sessions which are like paid for and, and put into the timetable so that people can actually go face to face at the same time all every week so that um they actually get the opportunity to have that sort of like off pitch bonding which is so important isn't it um yeah and, and often like yeah as you say in any especially you don't often get that um it was yeah. the especially in any you walk in it's 14 hour wait there's like hundreds of patients in your department and they're all dying and they're all sick and you're just like right I've just got to get in there and just start treating patients and seeing them um and I'm sure it's the same for you know our paramedic colleagues who come on shift and there's you know a stack of calls waiting to be answered etc um but I've, I've started making more of an effort to sit down and chat <laughs> which sounds <laughs> ridiculous but you sit down, you're like, hey, how was your weekend? What did you get up to? Oh, your son was playing football, you know, oh, 5-0. They like, got absolutely smashed. So, you know, just having a little chat with your colleagues. And, you know, I found out one of my colleagues is an ex-jockey and he used to race horses for a living. Um, but just knowing those little personal details and make it literally takes you two minutes. You can time it, two minutes. To, and especially yeah. with your junior colleagues and your nursing colleagues, et cetera, you'll, you'll have such a better working dynamic with them and when it comes to those tough situations like a, a resuscitation and a debrief etc if you know your team that little bit better because you took two minutes at the start of your shift to actually have some small talk um it's it's i think something that's really a powerful thing to do and pretty easy to achieve yeah that's absolute gold because it's 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 that stuff isn't it if, if you're chatting you can say well actually sorry i'm just in uh, dramatically enhancing well-being in the department and actually this is, this is a real priority for our modern day workforce that needs to be resilient in times of, of terror and toughness um yeah massively um that's that's really 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 good to hear um and so individual things what what, what do you what do you do feel to look after your your well-being the the, the question that i'm very uh. interested in here yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this is all learnt from topic like hard experience. I burnt out in COVID, much like many people. And um, when you're talking about stresses and primary, secondary stresses, it's all just uh, bringing up so many things that were going on for me at the moment, at, at the time even. So I had um, a new job. I had uh, a puppy. I had a house that I was renovating. I had a court case that I had to go to court with a builder uh, about um my parents were abroad my partner was working away and it was covid lockdown and you couldn't leave the house <laughs> so that was what was going on in my life at the time um and it was all pretty stressful from like an individual personal stresses that were going on and many of my usual coping mechanisms which you know unsurprisingly given we're on the world extreme medicine podcast were outdoors um were not available uh because of lockdown so um, I was a very unhappy bunny. And then I had a couple of difficult cases at work, some of which I've already talked about. There's a couple happened around about that time. Um, and I had started working a full-time A&E rotor for the first time in my life, which was terrible. And uh, <laughs> night shifts were mega hard. And nobody had told told me sort of some top tips and things to do and not do, etc. Um, and I was sort of all just figuring it out by myself. Uh, coming home to an empty house uh, with no nobody to talk to. Um, so you can already, when you start putting it like that, you're like, <laughs> well, obviously you were stressed out and obviously you burnt out. But at the time I was completely, had no insight into what was going on and thought that I should just be able to magically cope with all of this and so felt extra shame that I wasn't able to cope with it. Um, so... I actually ended up in A and E personally um, with a headache that wouldn't go away after a set of night shifts. I had about f I had four nights in a row. I was teaching medical students as well, which I love teaching, but it does add extra cognitive load um, to an already sort of like busy night shift. And I went home and I had like this headache that wasn't going away with paracetamol, with ibuprofen. I had a bit of neck stiffness and I called my consultant uh, and I was like, uh, what do you think? Like, do I need to get this checked out? And he's like, yeah, mate, you've got neck stiffness. Like you need to go, you need to go to A&E. So I ended up in A&E getting a CT head and I had a blood pressure of 160 over 90 uh, as a 24 year old. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, that was not ideal. <laughs> um so yeah probably a bit of a combination of blood pressure and tension and fatigue and lack of sleep uh had had culminated in a physical presentation of stress um so from then on i had to start taking that was the only that was the only thing that you stopped when eventually your actual body (laughs) physically broke down so that you couldn't even continue yeah, and unfortunately, that's the same for a lot of people. You know, you get ill, and that's what forces you to stop, rather than actually, you know, recognizing the warning signs, which I think I'm getting better at now. I certainly haven't ended up having getting another CT head, so that's good. Um, I, uh, I then had to start taking some of the coping mechanisms seriously. Um, so that was things like drinking enough water, not trying to have a social life whilst on night shifts. Um, making sure to get some exercise in whatever it was if it was walking outside if it was doing a bit of yoga um and maintaining a bit of a routine not eating like crap uh because that's so easy to do on nights you just pile in the crisps and the chocolate um and then and then you get fat and then you feel worse (laughs) so i actually said right let's try and swap some of that out for some fruit and some water etc make the sensible choices let's call friends every now and then let's speak to family let's get them in the loop and sort of keep the social network there so it's there if you need it um and i spoke to my my consultant about my rotor to see if there was anything we could do about it to make it a little bit more friendly um and i spoke to some of my colleagues about night shifts and how they manage and if they have any tips or anything like that and i started prioritizing my sleep above everything else um and yeah stopped trying to do so much all the time and started being a little bit kinder to myself uh and not having such big expectations of myself that's awesome i don't think i need to say anything else <laughs> that's <laughs> such a good summary of, 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 of how to look after yourself um, I think people will learn more from that than, than anything I think I, 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 essentially it's what I always say to, to my my sister who actually is always uh, she, she she's a civil servant so anybody who works in the UK knows that you know her job is not easy at the moment <laughs> but she's um, she, she I'm, I'm always saying to her like be more selfish um which sounds yeah. ridiculous but it's my little tagline for looking after yourself and putting yourself first um not other people not the department not your colleagues not your friends or family um sometimes you've got to cancel that dinner because you just can't face leaving the house and you haven't got the energy so it's, i'd be really bad at like making plans and then being like oh well i can't let my friends down so i'm gonna have to follow through on this even though i'm so tired i can't you know I'm just going to have to get on with it and do it. And I would do that, but I would do that for various different things over a period of months. And then it builds up to a point where you, you can't cope with it anymore. So, but you need to be okay with saying, actually, no, really sorry, mate. I'm not going to be able to make tonight because I am I just can't, uh, I haven't got the energy. Um, so putting yourself first and prioritizing yourself, that means your sleep. Um, that means your time. And it's really hard in A&E where, we do it we, we do the job to help others and so we are used to putting other people before us it means in a and e it means going for a wee it means actually drinking water on shift um and yeah. it means actually going home on time and being really strict about it and saying no i cannot just look at that acg i finished half an hour ago <laughs> um yeah so so be, being more selfish with your time and your resources I had quite a chilling comment from a patient who um, I we'd seen and they'd had weight loss and and uh, and basically it, it looked like they had developed a cancer at, like in their fifties, a relatively quite frighteningly young age, and um, and they also maybe had an infection, so they needed some antibiotics. And I was on it was say a thirteen hour shift, and and I, it was what my second shift leading the A and E department and I I tried to be good and let everyone else go for breaks, but I hadn't done that myself. And it and I was like, oh how on earth do you take a break here when it, if you basically all of medicine is deciding if you eat your sandwich, is someone gonna die? And in my head I was like, is uh it, when I take this break, this person's not gonna get their antibiotics for another like half an hour and that could really make a difference. So I went to to this patient and I, I I told I told them I was like oh like you know I'm I'm really sorry like it's a five hour wait but 
I've, I've, if it helps, I've, I've not taken, I've, I've not taken my break yet because I really want to see you. And they were like, what are you doing? Not taking your break. If you keep doing that, you're going to end up like me. And they're, they're totally right. Cause you, you'll end up with, you know, early cancer from the, which is proven now that that stress essentially causes cancer and, and all that stuff. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a great, uh, dressing down by by a patient saying you know like don't don't do this to yourself because it's actually like you know when when you're 50 what are you going to regret when you've you know if you're lucky enough to have a family and you've got people you love and you want to keep living and, and your life ends up being cut short because you've basically wrecked your body doing all of this stuff yeah and absolutely it seems like little things every day you know I'll just stay a bit longer I'll just work a bit harder I'll just sleep a bit less I'll just do a bit more do a bit more in my spare time I'll take my break a bit later or maybe I'll only have 20 minutes instead of 30 but that adds up over a career to become completely unsustainable yeah yeah absolutely yeah and I think that that there's hopefully this this resource as well will kind of allow that to become a bit clearer for employers and, and 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 that expectation on what we can put our healthcare staff through when we say actually you know there is an element that this is a genuine occupational hazard that we should take as seriously as exposure to handling radiation every day if you work in a nuclear power plant and all, all those sorts of things like you know this is a health risk and and, and actually, could you imagine you know, if we had little uh, if we had little stress radio- counters radio- instead of yeah, yeah. yeah, instead of radiation counters, we'd have little stress counters. That would be great. I would love that. It would be like, no, no, my stress count is 99 out of 100. I need to take my break. Goodbye. <laughs> but yes, um, this resource hopefully will be very powerful to show employers that this is how you support your workforce and how you keep them in work rather than them having to leave through burnout or ill health, etc. Uh, exactly. And I, and I think that's, that's the other thing. You, you want to, if you're an employee, you want to pay employees who are going to enjoy their job not burn out and actually turn up when you're paying them to turn up and, and that's not going to happen if, if you're running people into the ground and, and we end up in the situation that we're seeing now where there's there's a lot of holes and there's not that many people that can fill all of those holes now anymore because because it's, it's too much um so yeah i'm very i'm hopeful that this uh, if it hopefully with it, your help Fiona, on this uh, the world extreme medicine podcast if it spreads far and wide and people can see it and they can use this to, to make tangible change in their organizations into their personal life and with the teams that they're, they're working in to hopefully care for ourselves and then we can provide gold standard care to our patients oh fantastic matt and um i have that i would highly recommend having a read of the resource um and matt's going to tell us where we can find it in a minute and um also the video is absolutely excellent that matt's made uh with uh the hems team that he was attached to um it's a really good resource so even if you've only got five minutes or um when you're next taking your break when you should do on your shift um have a look at it and it's it it will um it will change the way you think about well-being and debrief i guarantee um and where can we find it matt so we can find this at resus.org.uk forward slash responder dash well-being or you can just google resus council responder well-being resource and you should be able to find a link there Fantastic. Well, I think that's a great place to finish. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you for creating this fantastic resource. And I hope that, as you say, it starts to influence um, the well-being of our of our responders and hopefully um, keep us happy and healthy and in work until we're 100. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much for having me, Fiona. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again.